Hi, I'm Joe Feeks, editor of Pig Health Today, and with me is Daryl Holkamp. He's a swine veterinarian at Iowa State University. Welcome to Pig Health Today. Thanks, Joe. Glad to be here. Last fall when we talked, you talked to me about the development of the Rapid Response Program, which has a Rapid Response Core. For the benefit of our viewers, can you walk us through the purpose of this program and how it came about? So the purpose of the, of the Rapid Response Program and, the, and then the Rapid Response Core that we've developed as part of that is to have a group of individuals, mostly swine veterinarians and some academics and uh, a few state animal health officials as well, who are available uh, in the event we have another transboundary disease like PD, for example. And uh, in the case of foreign animal diseases, foot and mouth disease, or classical swine fever, or African swine fever, uh, you know, USDA is going to take the lead on those, and so we'll probably you know, step aside for those. But for other diseases where uh, you know, there's nobody uh, really uh, in the federal or state governments who is there to, to take the lead on that, uh, we wanted to create a, a group of individuals who could go out and, and do epi investigations to try to figure out <laughs> perhaps how the virus got into the country in the first place, if we're able to do that, uh, and then for sure how it's being moved around from herd to herd. And, so and what, do, what viruses happen. are we talking about specifically? So uh, mainly viruses that are in other countries that are not in the U.S. today. And so an uh, example of that would be pseudorabies. Right? We cleaned up pseudorabies uh, years ago and it's still out there in, in various countries, but if it ever got into the U.S., that would be a problem for us. Uh, Seneca Valley virus would be uh, another example of one where uh, we didn't have it for a long time, and now it's, uh, now it's uh, apparently back in the country again here. Now, you've done, uh, I think, at least 10 investigations since you started this program last fall. Walk me through a typical investigation. How is it? outbreak reported and then tell me how you mobilized and what yeah. you did. Sure. So just to back up a little bit, we, uh, we uh, completed uh, the program and we populated the rapid response course. So we've got a training program we put together, it's online, uh, that, that uh, people we've recruited can go out, uh, listen to the modules or watch the modules, uh, pass a little quiz at the end, and, uh, and then they, uh, they are officially part of the rapid response core. And so we wanted to test that and to see how this would work in, uh, in, in real time. And so we, uh, we used endemic diseases uh, like PD as a, as a test case. And so uh, starting last November going through uh, this March, we had about 10 cases of PD uh, outbreaks uh, that occurred in uh, Oklahoma, um, a couple of Minnesota, one in Illinois. And uh, we decided to use that as, a, as an opportunity to, to test the program. And so we ended up having 10 of those investigations done uh, and the way it works is, uh, starting really from the beginning, once we learn of an outbreak, uh, then the first step is to recruit somebody that's part of the Rapid Response Corps. And, and because we've regionalized it, we want to try to get somebody that's in that region so they can get there quickly. And so then they would go out, conduct the investigation, and they would have at the table the farm manager, the herd veterinarian at a minimum, and many times they had several other individuals there as well. Uh, in every case, they did a walk through the farm, and then they would uh, complete the investigation, so you've done the 10 investigations. Um, is the program working the way you would hope? Well, I, in general, yes, uh, although we certainly found some things we can in, improve on. Uh, uh, one of the uh, things that I always do when I do investigations is uh, I have somebody along to take notes, and, uh, and then they help me write the report afterwards. Uh, in most of these cases, the, uh, the, the veterinarians or the, the, the individuals that went out and did the investigations or led the investigations, they did them by themselves. And I think what we found out is that makes it very difficult to capture all the detail, right? And so there was a lot of information that I normally would expect to have uh, that we just didn't quite get. And I think it's just, it's just very difficult to do that if you're trying to uh, both facilitate the investigation and capture all the information. Some other things we found was that uh, just timeliness. It was, in some cases, it was difficult uh, to get uh, somebody that could go out on you know, a day or two days notice and get everybody at the table. That sometimes is very difficult to do. And so one of the things we've tried to do now is, is, is expand the rapid response for add a few members in some regions so that we have a bigger pool to choose from. One of the things we've got planned to do this fall is to, uh, to develop a web-based application uh, to help us uh, uh, facilitate the, the investigations and, and do that better. So a lot of the things we struggle with, I think we can, we can do that better if we've got a, a 
uh, an online application there to streamline the process. And, and certainly speed is important for a rapid response right. program, uh, but it's not like you've got a bunch of specialists sitting around the firehouse waiting for the alarm to ring. I mean, walk me through the, the, the typical scenario. How do you go about pulling the right people together at the right time and getting them out to the farm as quickly as possible? Right. So, so that was the whole purpose of the Rapid Response Corps, so that we did have a team that, that they're, you know, they're essentially agree, agreeing uh, to be available on a moment's notice in the event of an actual emergency. And so um, all of them are very busy, busy people. They're not setting aside time to do this, but the individuals that we've invited have, have told us when we've asked uh, that they would drop what they have going on and, and actually get out there in an actual emergency. And so, um, you know, I, I think we feel confident that you know, if, if another PED virus were to occur, that the people we've enrolled in the rapid response for, they would change their schedule. They would make sure that they were able to get out there, that somebody was able to get out there and do it. Uh, the problem is you, you have to coordinate schedules with the farm manager and the, the herd veterinarian too, and that's uh, what created some problems for us this time to go around. But I think, you know, I, I think the industry takes this pretty seriously, right? And I think if we um, uh, had to get this done in, the, in an actual emergency, I, I'm pretty confident we, we'd be able to get it done in, and meet our goals for time on this. Now looking at the 10 investigations that you've done so far, have you seen some patterns? We were looking for connections to tie, you know, uh, two or more of these cases together. Um, they were, of course, far apart, fairly far apart in time and then also all the way from Oklahoma to Minnesota. Um, so we didn't find any smoking guns that kind of linked those cases. We had uh, dead removal and, and uh, uh, wean uh, pig removal. Uh, in four of the ten cases came up as being high likelihood and so there were some, some fairly substantial issues identified with each of those. Uh, feed delivery was, um, was also identified uh, two, of the four or two of the ten times as a high, high likelihood. And so there were some, some patterns. Um, uh, we didn't find anything though that really uh, I would say would be a smoking gun that would say, okay, this led to this, this current outbreak of all ten of these cases. So much of this comes down to biosecurity. What are the most common breaches in biosecurity that you see on these farms? Employee entry was one that, that came up over and over again. Uh, and I think it's, uh, you know, part of that is because it's such a high frequency event. Uh, it occurs uh, more frequently than any other risk event on every investigation we've ever done. And um, uh, another one is uh, repairs. And it, although it's a low frequency event, when it does happen, it tends to be oftentimes an emergency or, or uh, it's done by uh, by a repair department or maintenance department that, that they like to hide sometimes. They don't, they don't like to be front and center. And so we find lots of problems uh, there. Uh, the things uh, that you might, you might say first uh, on the list would be guilt entry and semen entry, uh, especially for PERS. And those we tend to find less often. And I think not that they're not important, but I think as an industry, we've done a fairly good job of dealing with those. And so we just don't see we still see problems with them, but we don't see a lot of problems uh, with them, not nearly like we used to. Now, your focus has been the transboundary diseases, but what did you learn so far from this program that could be applied to just the day-to-day the -day management of PERS, mycoplasma, other day-to-day -day yeah. bugs that we have on this wine farm? You know, you got to recognize that, that when it comes to biosecurity, it's extremely complex, right? And there are lots of risky events that happen on south farms every single day and so it's really a challenge then for producers and veterinarians as well to step back and say okay I've done all these things but what do I need to do next is there what what's what's the, the, the biggest gaps that I have right and so that's really what we put our focus on is trying to assess the biosecurity as it is uh, uh, along with the circumstances and identify specific risk events where there's room for improvement and then once we once we identify those opportunities for improvement or, or gaps if you want to look at it from a negative way, then we say, okay, how do you want to do that? And, and uh, to do that, we sort of look at, uh, you know, the series of, look at how a virus gets into a herd, right? And there's kind of a series of failures that have to happen. And so we can try to focus on making sure those carrying agents don't get contaminated or infected in the first place, or we can focus on mitigating that if it does occur, or we can focus on, on uh, preventing that virus uh, uh, from getting two pigs in the herd once that carrying agent arrives at the farm, right? So we can kind of focus on all three of those areas and identify low cost, low capital investment ways to do that and ways that maybe don't always require humans or if they do, they, we expect they would be complied with reasonably well. <laughs>